the internet is full of opinions on these two trucks, but I'm one of the few people that owns two trucks of the same year, a Toyota 2021 Toyota Tacoma and a 2021 Jeep Gladiator, both on 39s that I've built myself. So not only am I gonna share my opinion on what it's like to actually own and build these trucks, but I'm gonna give you specific measurements that you will not find anywhere else. The stock rear brakes on my 2021 Jeep Gladiator Rubicon are 342 millimeter. The rear drum brakes on my 2021 Toyota Tacoma are 254 millimeter. The rear axle on the Toyota Tacoma is definitely undersized and prone to bending, so I already upgraded it before that happened to me, but I still have the stock rear axle floating around, and I wanna give you some of these specs while I've got it in the shop. The rear axle on the 2021 Jeep Gladiator has a tube diameter of 82 millimeters. The rear axle on the 2021 Toyota Tacoma has a tube diameter of about 79 millimeters. The rear axle housing of the Gladiator has a tube thickness of about 10 millimeter or 0.93. The rear axle on the Tacoma has an axle tube thickness of about five millimeter or 0.200. Both the Gladiator and Tacoma have 32 spline axle shafts, but at the smallest point, the Gladiator's axle shaft measures out to 33.7 millimeter and the Toyota Tacoma measures out to 32.4. The ring gear in the Gladiator is 8.6 inches and the rear ring gear in the Tacoma is only 8.4. What do you think so far? I wanted to start with facts because every video I see comparing these two trucks, first off, it's by people usually that hasn't wrenched on, on them. Like, or maybe they just own a Toyota or they just own a Jeep. That doesn't satisfy me. I know it doesn't satisfy most of you. And they're giving you, it's just all opinion. And so I'm gonna give you some of my opinions towards the end of the video. But let's just talk in facts. You can factually determine which one of these trucks is better based on the sum total of its parts. It, this is, this shouldn't even be controversial even though I know it is. And if you don't believe me, take a look in the comment section of this video. So now what I wanna do is let's just talk about the interiors. Let's pull some basic measurements because a lot of that stuff that you see online, the interior measurements get kind of hard to wrap your head around. So instead of measuring things in cubic inches, let's just use Inches. How about floor to right up underneath our visor? 45 and a half inches. Floorboard to visor, 42 inches. Rear window to infotainment system. That should give us a good idea. 73 inches. Rear window to infotainment system, 72 inches. Armrest to armrest. 54 inches. Armrest to armrest, we are at 58 and a quarter inches. Slavy the runner, resale value. Which one is a better investment financially? I've seen a lot of mixed reviews on this, but what's cool is that Jeep is now like, their the points are on the board. There's a few lists that show that the Jeep has a higher resale value than the Toyota Tacoma now, but then you can look at other websites in the Toyota Tacoma. It's just so frustrating that no one uses actual data because if they used actual data, then we would have one answer instead of 10 different answers on which one has the best. But either way, they both are absolutely in like, if you just looked at trucks, they both have are gotta be in the top three to five because they both hold their value really well. Bedsides on the Gladiator are steel. I believe the tailgate is aluminum. Aluminum. Inside, that's steel, that's aluminum, but the bed itself is all steel. On the Tacoma, I've got this sweet aftermarket bed from Bowen Customs, but the stock bed had like a composite inside with a steel outside, and the composite was really nice in some ways, but they're also very prone to breaking. And they're so prone, in fact, multiple companies make bed stiffeners because enough people tighten their motorcycle down to the back of their truck that they were literally breaking the bed. Thomas Clickenbeard, I would ask if 25-year-old Nate was, <laughs> okay, I get where you're going with this. Spend his hard on money on one, faces going down $45,000 trucks. What would be the best bang for your buck? Well. 25 year old Nate would probably buy the one that's gonna get the most chicks. I would think that's probably the Tacoma because it's not just me that thinks these are great looking trucks. Um, so yeah, 25 year old Nate, a lot different. Uh, 37 year old Nate is a lot more practical. And if like right now, with all the experience I've had of both trucks, if I had to start from ground zero, pick one truck stock and then build it out, it would be that one. I would probably put one tons and 42s on it. 
um, it would be mine instead of my wife's, and uh, that would be the one I would choose now. But in, in my when I was in my 20s, it would probably be that one. I, you know, I was a glutton for punishment. I wouldn't care how good the specs are. I wanted something to look cool. The Gladiator still has a floor shifted transfer case with a four to one low range. The Toyota Tacoma has an electronically controlled transfer case with a 2.57 low range. The best transmission you can get in the Jeep Gladiator is an eight speed auto with a 4.71 to one first gear. The best automatic that you can get in the Toyota Tacoma is a six speed with a 3.6 first gear. The stock Tacoma comes with a crawl ratio of 36.16 to one. And after I put the 529 gears in it, it is now at a 48.94 to one. The Gladiator comes stock with a 70.27 to one crawl ratio. And after I put the 513s in it, it is now at a 96.64 to one. For those of you that haven't built very many off-road trucks, an automatic gets really good once you get above like 60 to one, but ideally 80 is a really nice target for an automatic. So for the Gladiator to have a 96.64, it's just insane. It's great control off-road. I think the biggest difference between these two trucks is the front suspension, steering, like that whole front combo. Now, this has pretty good clearance for 39s because it's only like a Dana 44, right? If it was 39s with one tons, we would lose even more clearance. But in any case, it doesn't matter compared to the clearance you get out of good IFS. I mean, the clearance of this is probably four or five inches higher than you get out of the Gladiator. However, you're looking at what is essentially a stock front end. This is bone stock steering. Look how fat that is. Bone stock steering. This is, um, I did do the gears. So I put 513s in it. It's got the stock locker because you can get a stock front locker with these. And then it's even got stock front axle shafts for right now. I've got some chromolies in the shop, but I haven't needed them yet. So I will, I will put those in eventually, hopefully sooner than later. But right now it's just pretty much all stock up there. Now this, we've got the Marlin Carler RCLT. Um, it pushes the axle width out seven inches wider than stock. This has a Land Cruiser 200 series rack for Marlin Crawler. Um, it's got Bill Stein coilovers in the front. We've got RCV axle shafts. There's a lot of money wrapped up in this. I mean, you cannot even compare the cost. <laughs> this is probably seven times more expensive to build the front end of this versus that because I mean, the lift kit was so cheap um, from Clayton that it just, it, it is very difficult to compare. And then of course I put 529 gears in this. I put a uh, ARB front locker cause you can't get these from the factory with a front locker. So you've got to source your own. And the amount of work and time that it took to build the front of this is insane when you compare it to the fact that this is just a small lift and some gears. William Grimes asks towing. At least I think he's asking about towing. So it's very clear what the winner is here. It's the vehicle that makes peak torque at 1400 RPM. It makes like a hundred and some odd more foot pounds of torque than that does. And it does it at like, you know, a quarter of the RPM or whatever. So, I mean, 1400, you're at 400 and something foot pounds of torque. It's going to tow a hundred times better than something that makes peak torque at like four or five grand. I can't remember exactly what the spec is on this, but we'll talk about that. So when I towed with this, when it was stock, I towed like a little all aluminum like trailer. It didn't like, it did not like hills. It would do most hills, mountain passes. It wouldn't even hold 70. And it was just like screaming, like 6,000 RPM in order to get uh, up those hills. So it doesn't like towing. It The cam profile is not good for towing. It's good for high RPM horsepower, not low RPM power, which is what you need in order to tow comfortably. Now, one other thing I wanna say is within the last month, I had this up in Canada and we were towing up a rocky stream um, in four low, like crawling with lockers on, and it was unreal how well it did. It, it was not an easy thing to tow uphill in running water, and this was able to do it. No transmission temp issues, nothing like that. It handled it like a champ. This has transmission temp issues without towing, just, just tooling around on the Rubicon. As soon as you're doing those like really slow crawls up stuff, it's not happy because it's just simply not geared low enough. The most powerful engine that you can get for the Jeep Gladiator today is the three liter eco diesel that makes 260 horsepower at 3,600 RPM and 442 pound feet of torque at between 1,400 and 2,800 RPM. 
The best engine available for the Toyota Tacoma is a 3.5 liter engine that makes 278 horsepower at 6,000 RPM and 265 pound-feet of torque at 4,600. There's one issue that I have with both these trucks that I want to talk about, and that is the air filters. So this air filter, the, uh, first off, this is very unique. This is not typical to be able to suck your air like into the engine from like over the fender. This is really smart, but this air filter is way too small. This is crazy how small it is. So it, it doesn't take long for this to get completely full of dirt. And then that makes the EGR cooler run hot. And this isn't something I've read in forums. I've owned 16 diesels. I know this to be true. If you have a clogged up air filter, it is going to raise your EGTs, your exhaust gas temperatures. That is then going to raise the temperature of your EGR cooler. The EGR is cooled by engine coolant. So all these people who have issues in the summertime running um, with you know hot temps and their eco diesel, I guarantee if you took better care of that super undersized <laughs> air filter, you would run lower engine temps in the summer. I, I guarantee it. Just as someone who's owned a whole lot of diesels. Now... We have a similar problem with this. The air filter is great. It's huge. This should have a really long life before it gets full, but there's a couple things going on here. This is pulling its air from a very typical place. This is not a Toyota only thing. Land Rover does this, tons of cars. I mean, you can buy brand new vehicles today that have this, this exact same issue. And then if you do what I did and you put 39s on it and you've got to put big fiberglass fenders on it, you no longer even have a fender liner to help try to mitigate some of that dust and dirt that gets in there. So long term, the solution would definitely be to run a snorkel. I'd have to do some sort of a custom thing going through the inside of the fender, and then that would help take care of the problem here because this is definitely a big enough air filter. It's just because of where it pulls the air from makes it basically have the exact same problem. Like every two trips or so, if it's dusty, I've got to change out those paper elements. The Jeep Gladiator is like every other modern truck. It has a tube frame. It's, it's like a rectangle, right? This is how all modern trucks are built. It's how they've been built for like 20 years. The Toyota Tacoma is the only truck that I know of that you can buy today that is still a C-channel frame. And above and beyond that being a problem, it's also a riveted frame. So it's not even welded. That makes it ultra, ultra flexible. And the load carrying capacity on the, these trucks is very small. And when you have something that is as flexible and as bouncy as the frame is on these trucks, if you go over that weight, I guarantee you're gonna bend that frame before anything else. And I have read a lot of stories of bent frames on the Toyota Tacoma. I know they had that frame issue where they had to recall a ton of Toyota frames um, with, the with the Tacoma because of rust. And I don't know where those were rusting, but I could tell you exactly where this one could rust if I lived on the East Coast or something like that. It has a front frame section that is riveted over the rear frame section or under, I don't remember. But in any case, these two frame sections cross, they rivet it all together and then they like put a sealant around it. If that sealant breaks at all or deteriorates and you get any contaminants between those two plates, it is gonna rust all the way through. Whereas if you have a boxed frame, like all modern trucks, they weld the entire thing together. There's no rivets. So it's way, way, way less flexible. It rides way better on road, off road. It is, it is, this is an antiquated design. There is no doubt about it. But on top of that, they basically just dip the whole thing in a vat of like special frame paint. And then when it comes back out, there's nowhere for contaminants to get in, especially because you don't have metal sandwiched together that's just stuck together with rivets. This is a big problem for Toyota in my, in my opinion, and I really hope that they decide to address it in the next iteration of this truck. The question of vehicle reliability has bothered me for a very, very long time because the first time someone started talking to me about how one vehicle was more reliable than another, I worked at a Chevy dealership like 20 years ago, and it was a Ford guy telling me how unreliable Chevys are compared to Fords, and I'm, I don't care. But when, as soon as I started asking for you know them to cite any sort of a source, even back then, they would just send me like a website link to some magazine article that I've never heard of. And right next to the number one 
vehicle on the list is paid advertising by that manufacturer. It's like, how can you trust this as a reliable source? And here we are all these years later, and I still haven't found a reliable place to get this reliability data. I mean, it, I just don't think it's a coincidence that, it, you know, if it says Honda Ridgeline, number one most reliable vi vehicle, right next to it, there's a Honda ad. I mean, there's no way I'm the only person who sees this as problematic. And so far, the only, I shouldn't say the only, so far, the most reliable source that I've found is Consumer Reports. And th that data set is only as reliable as Yelp. It is literally consumers reporting what their experience is. So you've got a soccer mom that has had issues with her, let's just say Toyota, and she doesn't know anything about trucks or cars, whatever she happens to own, but she's going to report those problems to Consumer Reports. And we're going to trust that and say that that is reliable information. I, I have huge issues with all of these lists and all of these places that people cite as reliable data. If you have a place that maybe is a .gov or something that you think is like really trustworthy, please let me know in the comments because every single list I have ever seen is paid for by somebody. And that makes that list worthless to me because I know that Toyota has given Toyotas to YouTubers to make content with. I know that Ford has done the exact same thing with the Bronco. And what do you know? I've got some friends that are YouTubers that they get wined and dined by Jeep whenever we go to EJS. This is where I lose subscribers. I'm gonna point out every single thing that we learned in this video. It's got larger brakes. It's a, it's a physical thing that we can prove. It has larger axles. It has lower transfer case gears and a super strong proven transfer case. My buddy Sean has a 606 horsepower V8 swap that he put in his Gladiator. That exact same transfer case is behind it. Super, super strong parts, what we're talking about here. Lower transmission gears and more gears. It has a higher seating position. It has more power. It gets better fuel economy. It has a better frame. It has a stronger bed. They don't make bed stanchions for the Jeep Gladiator because you don't bend them. It's not a, it's not a thing because it's all steel. You know, it's, it's cheaper to build. Like, that's just physically true. I didn't modify those fenders or anything. If you bought a Jeep Gladiator and you just break out the Costco toolkit in your driveway, in an afternoon, you can have a Gladiator on 39s. And, you, and with this wheel tire combo, you can bolt the tires and wheels together without a tire machine. I'm telling you, it's Legos for grownups. It's insane how easy these are to put together. Now, roll cage. I didn't bring this up. The roll cage in Jeeps is way better than Toyota people say that it is. Um, and I know that because I'm alive. I rolled three and a half times down a nasty, 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 fall um, in my Jeep TJ. And the cage saved my life. And the cage didn't even bend or distort. The cage is still in there right now after that rollover all these years. That was like 10 years ago. And I measured it. It is completely true. It is completely square. There's no dents in the cage. There's no reason for me to retire the cage. Now, it's not an Ultra 4 cage, but these Jeep cages can save your life. I really wish that there was a way to do a cage inside of the Tacoma, but with the side curtain airbags, it's really dangerous, in my opinion, to put a cage in a truck like that. Now, more durable steering. Now, the list could probably continue to go on. Like, I could just keep tacking on little things that are physically better. It's not an opinion. They're just physically better on the Gladiator than the Tacoma. Now, Tacoma, I got to give it some credit. It's the best looking truck I've ever owned. I love the looks of these trucks. I, I, I think that's one of the best looking trucks you can possibly buy. Um, and then the handling characteristics are insane. I have never driven anything like this. If you're willing to put long travel and rear coilovers on it, you will have something that handles and rides better than any Gladiator. I don't care what they do to the Gladiator. The IFS handling characteristics on this are insane. I've never driven anything like it. So the silver lining, Toyota people. Let's be friends. I'm a Toyota people too. I promise. I have another Toyota on the other side of that wall that we're going to build later this year. And it's not a Tacoma, but trust me, you are going to like it. It is going to be rowdy. Um, and it's got way less electrical gizmos. I think I'm going to like it a lot better too. But the good news here is that with Jeep building such rad trucks and with the Bronco being so rowdy out of the box, the Bronco Raptor is insane. I think that these other companies are proving to Toyota that the U.S. market is worth it. They don't need to just give us the cheapest Mexican-made Toyota truck, and that's all we get to choose from. Why don't we have the Hilux here? Why don't we have the real Land Cruiser here, the 70 Series? I don't know, but I'm hoping that maybe the next generation 4Runner will have a removable roof. 
How rad would that be? And a front locker option. If they just did those two things to the 4Runner, it's already got a box frame, rear disc brakes, uh, rear coils. It's already most of the way there to be an awesome off-roader. If they just did a couple small mods, how exciting would that be? The Gladiator being so good, I think, puts pressure on Toyota to hopefully innovate and make the next generation Tacoma, the next generation 4Runner, maybe even bring a real Land Cruiser here. It makes them better for all of us. So. I hope I didn't ruffle anybody's feathers too much and that you saw that I'm trying to be as factual as possible. I have some opinion in here, but I think compared to the other Toyotaverse Jeep videos, this has got way less opinion and way more facts as someone who physically is a fan of both trucks so much that I went out and spent tons of money to own and build both. So give me a little bit of credit here. Now, we've got hats, we've got merch. If you like these videos, make sure you support us somehow. If you can't afford to buy merch or any of that other stuff, just like, make sure you subscribe. I'm guaranteed to lose subscribers on this video from Tacoma owners. So if you wanna see more honest, even keeled reviews like this, you gotta help support me so I can grow the channel and afford to do that. So thank you so much for watching. We'll see you on the next one.